to everybody, it's a great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this uh, virtual side event uh, on the occasion of the 20, uh, 43rd session of the Human Rights Council. Uh, we, the title of the side event is Mind the Gap, Human Rights and Non-State Parties to Armed Conflict. But let me start by thanking uh, France and Slovenia for co-sponsoring uh, this event. And the very special thank must go for Fight for Humanity for organizing this webinar on this uh, very important topic. At today's event, we will address the question whether and how human rights law should be applied to or respected by non-state parties. While uh, non-state parties to conflict have been increasingly approached, approached in the past on humanitarian issues, on uh, issues uh, regarding international humanitarian law, there is still a clear gap when it comes to human rights. And this question is particularly relevant for non-state actors that control territory and people. And this it regularly goes hand in hand with the concerned state not having little or no direct influence over the protection of human rights in these territories. So our objective is to provide a space to discuss concrete ways forward on how to improve the protection and enjoyment of human rights of, this, of the people in these areas. Um, but let me now introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Professor uh, Vasilka Samsin. Uh, she's in Ljubljana. She's a professor for international uh, public law, head of the Department of International Law, and also director of the International of the Institute of, for International Law and International Relations. Uh, professor Samsin is also a member of the Human Rights Committee, and she has, among others, done uh, research also uh, in the international uh, law of conflict. So it's good to have you, Professor. Then the second speaker, um, there's probably not really a need to introduce her, is Agnes Kalamar, the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions. I'm sure you know her uh, very well. She has, uh, Agnes has a distinguished career in human rights and humanitarian work globally. She has been working for civil society, UN and academia. She's currently also the director of the Columbia University Global Freedom of Expression Initiative. Uh, Agnes has done many research in many areas, among others also in the area of non-state actors. Also warm welcome to you, Agnes. Then we have Emily Max, who is a researcher uh, in international humanitarian law at the Geneva Academy. Uh, she, maybe you, some of you might know her, but she's organizing the IHL talks. And her research focuses on the intersection between IHL as international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Then our fourth speaker is Anne. Uh, Christine uh, Anki Sjöberg, uh, the co-founder and uh, founder and co-director of the Fight for Humanity. Uh, Anki has a, is a very experienced humanitarian human rights professional. She has been working in many different uh, uh, NGOs, uh, in particular linked with conflict, security, and gender. And her PhD focused, among others, on armed non-state actors. So you see we have a very distinguished panel. We have only a women, a pure women panel. I think that's great. And now I think before we open, uh, before we go to the discussion, um, there we will have a poll and I give the floor back to Nicolas. So, uh, yeah, before starting, we would like to know more about your expectations from this webinar. So now Paul is uh, opening a new screen. So if you could uh, enter the question, what are your expectations from this meeting? And you have uh, four different options uh, just to understand a little bit uh, what you're uh, expecting from the event. So I'll give you five more uh, seconds. So we have already 
about 50 percent of the people who have voted okay so i think this is okay i'm going to share the result okay so we have uh, 72 percent of the people who said that they want to learn more about the practical changes which is good because i think uh, we have the right speakers so um um, now we can we can we can start with the with the discussion. So Peter, uh, I hand you back the the floor. Uh, thank you, Nicolas. Um, my first uh, question goes to Emily, and let's talk a bit about um, the non-state armed actors or non-state parties. Uh, Emily, can you elaborate on which non-state actors could qualify as non-state parties and maybe also which international legal frameworks are applicable to non-state parties, including also de facto authorities? Over to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Ambassador Matt. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank uh, France, Liechtenstein and Slovenia, as well as Fight for Humanity for organizing today's event. I really look forward to hearing uh, my fellow panelists also take on this question. Um, I think the first place to start is by saying that non-state parties is a term that is connotated under international law and under international humanitarian law specifically. Um, and so it refers to parties to non-international armed conflicts that are not state authorities. And to qualify as such, um, non-state parties must fulfill conditions either under common Article 3 to the Geneva Conventions or under Article 1 of a, uh, Additional Protocol 2 to the Geneva Conventions uh, when it is applicable. So for the sake of common Article 3, which is applicable to all types of non-international armed conflict and has its own threshold, it is lower than the second one, um, non-state parties must primarily fulfill um, organizational criteria, meaning that they have to be sufficiently organized. Um, and sufficient organization is defined as a group's ability to follow a certain common structure and its capacity to sustain military operations. In any case, it's a threshold of, an again, of, sorry, of organization that is lower than that of state's authorities. And then where additional protocol two is applicable, you have a different threshold for concerned groups, and it is higher. It is that of responsible command and the ability to exercise control over part of a state's territory, which means that the armed group can, through responsible command, carry out, sustain and concert a military operation and also has the capacity to actually implement additional protocol too. So to sum up, non-state parties are always bound by rules of international humanitarian law, either common Article 3 with the relatively low threshold as long as sufficient organization is fulfilled, and then in certain circumstances, additional protocol too. And then there is the questions of are non-state parties also bind by hu international human rights law, which is at the heart of today's discussions. Um, and without dwelling too much into the details, which I'm sure we will delve into in a second, um, I just want to say a following things. The first one, there is an uncertainty, uh, if not several, if not a controversy, um, as to whether international humanitarian law actually bounds as a matter of law non-state parties to armed conflict because it's a legal framework that is only addressed to states. So it only speaks up in the text of the law and in the heart of the law of states obligation. Whereas IHL, for instance, talks of parties to the conflict. Um, but there seems to exist consensus, at least um, as a matter of policy, if not as a matter of law, with regards to non-state parties or armed non-state actors that exercise stable control over territory and are being able to act as state-like entities what we call de facto authorities or, or state-like entities. Um, this seems to be, you know, the minimum agreeable to um, many stakeholders, humanitarian organizations, UN entities, and independent experts alike. There are other views um, that go a bit further. So I wanted to give, you know, the minimum agreeable point. And even for that minimum agreeable point that de facto authorities are bound as a matter of policy, at least, there is controversy regarding the extent of the obligation. Um, is it just an obligation to respect human rights or is it also an obligation to protect and fulfill? Um, so I think that's it. Uh, and I look forward to also hearing different views on the issue. <laughs> 
thank you very much, Emily, for this. Uh, maybe building on that, um, my second question would go to Professor Samsing. Um, I mean, talking more about uh, what Emily referred to about human rights law, uh, what is the situation regarding non-state parties and maybe also other armed groups uh, in respect to human rights specifically, uh, or are they, maybe also are they bound by human rights? So maybe you can a bit further elaborate on this question. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Ambassador Thank you. Matt, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where from our attendees are listening to us. Um, I would also like to thank the organizers for the invitation and, of course, also all the co-sponsors of this event on these highly uh, topical issues. Building on what Emily has said, I perfectly um, agree with this assessment that there is no uh, general consensus on existing normative legal framework that would put forward legal obligations on non-state parties or other organized armed groups. Um, but at the same time, I would like to say that um, in effect, I think that there is an expectation of the international community that the non-state actors will respect human rights norm, norms um, in all situations, but in particular in those where they are in uh, de facto control over the territory and the population. Um, but except if there are special agreements in place, which is also possible that an armed group concludes an agreement with the state authorities to respect human rights norms, there are some examples in practice, except in such exceptional circumstances, I would say um, there is only a legal obligation on the state to ensure such respect. So I would here make a distinction between the expectations of the international community from the non-state actors to um, respect human rights norms as opposite to the obligation, legal obligation of the states to ensure um, such respect. And the reason is that in general, as we know in practice, the main problem is how to um, actually enforce <laughs> these obligations. And while um, there are certain mechanisms in place, uh, including various uh, United Nations bodies, be it uh, treaty bodies or otherwise, who regularly monitor the situation and discuss and enter into dialogues with state authorities on uh, respect of human rights obligations, there are no similar mechanisms in place that would engage non-state actors, which is why this obligation to actually enforce this respect for human norms rests with the states. It's a very brief answer, but I'm sure there will be more discussion on this issue. Of course, I can speak of many examples in practice where uh, several uh, reports, be it of inquiry commissions or special reporters, uh, where they have referenced uh, to obligations of non-state actors to respect or to stop with abuse or violations of human rights obligations, be it in Sudan, Libya, Syria, and so on. So we have some examples, but this would at most um, constitute, in my view, some, let's say, soft law developing um, um, consensus on uh, approach, let's say, to how to address obligations of uh, non-state actors rather than already existing uh, legal obligations under existing international legal framework. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Maybe building on that, on um, uh, talking about obligations, and we talk about obligations, we of course also have to talk about violations. So my next question would go to Agnes. Um, Agnes, how should we name acts of violence against civilians by non-state parties? Should it be violation of, violation of human rights, abuses, or something else? And how do we name the duties? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have speak, spoken about obligations, or should it be duties, responsibilities, or something other? Over to you, Agnes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you to uh, everyone, uh, the organizers and, and the panelists. Um, of course, the uh, question uh, is not a semantic question. Um, what you are raising here is a, a matter of legal, uh, legal recognition 
and in my view, recognition under the human rights framework of who the perpetrators are and who the victims are. Um, the, the two previous panelists have well uh, put forward the uh, mainstream orthodox perspective on uh, whether human rights currently apply to armed groups. And in, of course, at the moment, uh, there is very little jurisprudential um, evidence pointing to uh, them being uh, accountable under the human rights framework. However, I hope that this uh, discussion today and others are not meant to reiterate uh, what has been the state of play for the last uh, 70 years or more, but to really uh, unpack avenues for us to challenge what is clearly not matched for the reality of 2020. And indeed, I think it was not matched for previous uh, reality. I just want to uh, deviate a little bit to remind our listeners that for uh, many decades now, the human rights framework has been contested. And it is through that contestation that we have evolved to make it a living framework that is a framework that is uh, in uh, uh, matching the, the lived reality of people and particularly the victims. That contestation has included or that demanded a revised understanding of what we meant by torture. It has demanded a revised understanding of what we meant by women's human rights. And this has been the only way we have ensured that texts that were founded in 1948 were actually remain actually uh, uh, as important now as they were before. How? Because we have interpreted them so that they are relevant to our um, context and so on. So what is the context at the moment? Yes, the context is that right now, armed groups are bound by IHL, or some of them, are bound possibly by international criminal law if they um, commit a certain type of crimes. And what has not been mentioned thus far, but which is the white elephant uh, in, in the discussion, they have been bound by the so-called international counterterrorism regime, which in my view has developed for the last 20 years in order to hold non-state actors to account. So for 20 years, we have had states developing a new international regime to focus solely on so-called armed groups. And by doing so, I think no one will object to that. By doing so, that regime has deeply weakened international humanitarian and, and, and human rights law. And it has also eroded victims protection and accountability. Um, it has created crimes linked to uh, terrorism. And the most prevalent crime of all has been membership to a terrorist organization, which is almost uh, the, the main uh, kind of uh, charge and crimes that will be uh, imposed and opposed to, um, to members of armed groups, which means that the victims are completely neglected. Membership to a terrorist organization does not leave space for the victims of those so-called terrorist organizations. Uh, for all those reasons and many more, which I have elaborated upon in my, one of my reports, I do not believe that at the moment, the international legal framework is fit for purpose. We as an international community are confronting armed groups, and I will elaborate later on on, on what I mean there, which have proven to be extremely uh, violent uh, and have perpetrated, at least certainly over the last 10 years, some of the worst atrocities against people. But we do not have an adequate legal framework, uh, with the exception of international criminal law, which for a range of reasons has not been uh, very well applied at, um, at the moment. So, yes, Indeed, international human rights law is meant to be uh, a body of rules which applies to states. Uh, it is intended as a law for states. It is intended as a law um, regulating the relationship between uh, people and, and states. 
but by privileging a, a narrow orthodox reading, which was maybe meaningful in 1948, but is no longer meaningful in 2020, we have neglected, we have denied, we have rejected, and we have silenced the experience of people who live under the control of armed groups. And I'm not just talking about people in Syria or Iraq who were ruled by Daesh. I'm also talking about people in Central America whose life is completely underpinned by uh, the existence of cartels and, and gangs. So I think for me, I understand the, the discussion today as challenging us, challenging us to rethink how we are making sense of the lived experience of millions of people around the world who thus far have been neglected by the human rights framework. And there is no doubt in my mind that this human rights framework applies to their realities. And there is no doubt in my mind that the violence perpetrated against them by groups and individual members of those groups that control those people and control the territories amount to human rights violations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Agnes, for your passionate statement. Um, Anki, uh, building on what, uh, what uh, Agnes told, we're talking about victims. Um, you can a bit elaborate on that, or is there, should there be a, is there a distinction between victims of state and non-state acts, or should there be any? Over to you, Anki. Um, yes, so thank you, Peter, and the thanks to the co-organizers, and particularly thanks to the, the previous speakers. Uh, I think this is starting to be very interesting. I, I love all the interventions so far, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna take advantage of my privilege of being a non-lawyer today. So that's gonna be my, my po point of departure. Uh, and I could see, I guess, from the results of the polls that we have quite a few lawyers, I think, in the audience, because only 37% were are here to learn about the legal framework and uh, more people are here to learn about practical challenges and ideas for protection of people in this area. So voila, I'm going to be talking to all of you, but not from the legal perspective. And I think that um, if you would ask random people on the street, if non-state parties to conflict or other organized armed groups and their political and civilian things, if these actors have human rights responsibilities or even obligations, uh, I think many would probably not hesitate to say yes. Um, and this would not be based on a legal assessment, uh, but on a pragmatic approach, probably based on the principles of, of people. Um, and I think this goes also, and Agnes uh, really uh, referred to that already, um, to the question if there should be a difference between victims of states and non-state actors. So if we go back to, the, to Article 1 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, so it's all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So I think to me, based on that, I think really independently on who control the territory that you live in and who is controlling your access to rights, um, yeah, from a principled point of view, there should be no distinction. Uh, then um, on the other part of the question, if there is a distinction between victims uh, of state and non-state actors, I think, yes, we, I would say yes, definitely, um, because uh, of the legal uh, framework. And we know that uh, people in non-state areas don't necessarily have access to the same right, the same protections. The victims don't have the, the, the same uh, treatment. Uh, and that's actually what kind of triggered the creation of uh, Fight for Humanity, of, of our organization, that we want to work for, um, that there should be no difference, there should be no gap. Uh, and before creating uh, Fight for Humanity, me and the colleagues, uh, we have been working in, in different um, conflict uh, situations or situations of, of armed violence where uh, that were either controlled by non-state parties or strongly influenced by them. Uh, and we would see there that uh, people often had troubles of getting um, support, reparation and justice. Uh, and this was the case, for example, for uh, victims of landmines and other weapons, victims of sexual violence, uh, children that were uh, demobilizing, people who were detained, so whether they were detained due to a link to the conflict or not, due to other uh, charges, uh, victims of tortures, etc. Uh, this seems also to be the case for uh, human rights, such as freedom of expression and association, access to justice, education, 
uh, the right not to be discriminated against um, because of your gender, religion, ethnicity, your disability status, etc. Uh, and we think really that the fact that people are victimized in this context and not treated equally, this creates a, a problem for, uh, for the future and for now, and it weakens the social cohesion, it creates obstacles to peace uh, in these uh, complex settings. And, and for sure, in situations of armed conflict, there is no functioning normal legal system uh, as by default, uh, as the state has lost the monopoly of the use of the armed force. So of course, ensuring anyone's human rights in this uh, context is a challenge, whether it's controlled by the state mainly, or in, uh, it's in areas under the control of non-state parties. So the victims in this context then can be victims of the conflict, but also then of other abuses that happen in the territories where they are. So they can be victimized by both state parties and non-state parties and different levels of violations that can be IHL violations or human rights violations. And I think as a consequence, we see that many people who are, who are uh, refugees or displaced have also been victimized by, by different um, actors and, and like suffered different types of, of, of abuses. Uh, just maybe one final point on, uh, on this issue. Uh, I think we, we also find that there is a, an information gap often on the situation of human rights in, in non-state areas, uh, on, um, on the victims of abuses, uh, also because um, non-state areas are often not part of official statistics. Uh, if there are global studies, often when people are including data, you have access just to the national authority data, not necessarily to data from, um, from the non-state areas. Uh, also, um, there is the issue that people who are uh, in these areas and who are reporting on abuses, they can also be um, victim of retaliation for reporting. So uh, then that also limits um, the, the data that we, we have on, on what is the actual situation. And for sure, uh, now there are many special rapporteurs uh, like Agnes Kalana uh, and others that are paying uh, attention to this issue now. And I think um, it is, uh, we, have, we have more information, but still uh, many victims of non-state parties abuses will not be reported on and they will not get justice. Thank you, Anki. Um, well, we heard that there, in principle, there should not be a distinction, but in fact there is. Maybe we dig, dig, dig deeper into that. And Professor Sansin, um, should there be a distinction between the victims of different non-state armed actors. For example, depending on their objectives, if they are defined as political or not, or, or depending on the extent to which they control territory and people or their existing resources for compliance. Could you a bit elaborate on that? Over to you. Yes, thank you. And um, well, there is a difference in opinions also to this question, but uh, undoubtedly, for example, even the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights has consistently held that when um, non-state actors are actually exercising some government-like functions and they control the territory, they are obliged to respect human rights uh, norms, um, when they're conducting their affairs and, and uh, exercising their control over individuals in this territory. So uh, regardless of their political motivations um, or uh, other aspirations, so to say, objectively, if they are in control and they have the capacity to um, respect and also ensure respect of human rights in this case over the people in this territory, they are expected to do so. Um, this is reflected also in various um, reports of panels of uh, special procedures experts, for example, in 2007 report to the Security Council of such a panel to, on Sudan, uh, where it was clearly expressed that um, such um, actors, non-state actors, bear responsibility in areas under their control to uh, guarantee human rights of the people on such territories. There are other examples in practice, including, for example, the opinion of the um, Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Committee, which uh, clearly expressed in its 2030 general recommendation number 30, that um, the, um, under certain circumstances, in particular where an armed group with an identifiable political structure exercises significant control over territory and population, 
these non-state actors are obliged to respect international human rights. So um, yes, um, there are various, uh, there is various evidence that um, such behavior is not only um, want, um, is not only desirable, but is actually already um, transposed into an um, existing expectations, as I said previously, from the international community that non-state actors, when they objectively control the territory and population on such territory, will respect uh, the human rights. But then again, as I try to um, also a little bit elaborate on in my pre previous uh, remark, I think the, the problem rests with enforceability of such um, obligations, because in the end of the day, I mentioned a few examples of, of um, existing cases, let's say the, the, the latest uh, CEDAW um, uh, um, opinion, Interlocutors, when we are getting to the phase of uh, monitoring, are the states. There are very few uh, mechanisms or, let's say, fora available for such a dialogue with those non-state actors that are in control of the territories. And therefore, my opinion is that if we want to uh, make some progress in this respect, we should think of various ways of engagement of these non-state actors in the dialogue with all the relevant stakeholders, be it the authorities uh, of those countries or uh, various other actors, be it from uh, UN or some regional organizations. I think this is the, the real gap that we are witnessing in practice uh, because um, while we have these obligations on the paper, it, the, the challenge is how to translate them into practice. And therefore, I think we need to bring them at the table and um, start a meaningful dialogue with these non-state actors also on their human rights obligations and not only on IHL obligations, which has been done in practice and several code of conducts have been concluded and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sansin. Um, um, there was, I think, also an interest to go into practice or how is the, relation, uh, the situation on the ground. So my second question to Agnes would be, uh, what is the practice in relation to non-state parties to conflict and human rights? Are they respecting uh, the human rights? Or, I mean, we, or Professor Sansi <laughs> already mentioned that there is an implementation yeah. gap, but uh, maybe yeah. you can also further elaborate on that. Over to you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Peter. I think what's uh, important to highlight, and uh, Vasilka has already uh, mentioned it, we are fully aware of the atrocities perpetrated by Daesh. Um, we know um, a lot or too much about what's happening in Mexico or in El Salvador at the hands of cartels. So I don't think we need further proof that armed groups are capable of committing crimes which are in pair with what the worst states can commit. When I talk about Daesh, I should also mention the fact that Syria, the government of Syria, has been responsible for the worst possible crimes uh, in, in the last decade as well, you know, or some of the worst possible crimes. I don't know what's, uh, um, what the scale anymore. Uh, so I, I would like to go back to what Vasilka pointed out regarding control. I think we need to understand that those groups do not rule only through force, blunt violence or cruelty. And this is why human rights matter. Um, all of the groups that I have studied, including Daesh in particular, by the way, but also the gangs in El Salvador exercise what I have defined as governance function uh, on the territories that they held. And here I want to insist again as well on the fact that territory needs to be understood very flexibly. Um, for instance, in many uh, situations where armed groups operate, they may control territories in, you know, from eight in the evening to seven in the morning, and then governments will control territory from seven in the morning or 701 
to uh, midnight. This is a reality of many endemic situation of violence falling short of uh, non-international armed conflict. Uh, already in 1965, a very well-known sociologist has insisted that governments that are losing to an insurgency are, aren't losing because they lose on a military front. They are losing because they lose on the governance front. And studies after studies have provided further empirical evidence to that conclusion. The, the quality of local governance, including the provision of services and dispute resolution, is a far greater determinant of how those groups are going to raise and hold on to power than their actual military capacities. That's a message that most states refuse to listen to. And um, unfortunately, this is a reality. The governance function of those groups must be taken into account when we think of what they are doing. Because if we don't take this into account, we do not have the instrument. We do not know how to um, respond to it. Of course, they also govern through uh, uncertainty by spreading uncertainty, by spreading fears, but they also engage in the promulgation of rules and in their implementation. I should also uh, remind us so that right now in northern uh, part of uh, Syria, the Kurdish groups are holding territories and are holding vast prisons, which we are very happy, quotation mark, the Western world and the rest, very happy for them to do so. Um, these are judicial uh, policing activities. They have suggested that they can actually uh, start holding trials for those um, uh, alleged uh, Daesh members. Uh, what is the international community going to do? Are they going to just say, oh, well, you know, the law doesn't allow, or are they going to do what they do right now, which is to try to avoid engaging with the substantive issues, but letting people, um, you know, in those prisons, uh, even though they will be prepared to argue that legally that should not be um, the case. So the, the, the complexity of the situation that we are confronting demand that we do not uniquely rely on uh, IHL for understanding the uh, obligations of those groups and our obligations vis-a-vis -vis the people that are controlled by, uh, by those groups. Uh, and um, these governance functions have led me in one of my recommendations in my report to suggest that we actually need to do far more understanding of those governance, governance functions to create a taxonomy of what they are doing uh, and to uh, somehow create a scale of armed groups which is not based on the military understanding of control, which is what IHL is proposing, but a governance understanding, which is what IHRL is suggesting. And that's why it's so important that we bring this regime into our management of armed groups. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes, for this, I think, very important point you made. Um, my sec next question goes to Emily and with builds on, I think you could build on what Agnes said, uh, looking maybe also why are non-state parties to conflict respecting or not respecting human rights or also maybe related to what Agnes said, what she calls the governance, um, uh, governance function of, of, uh, of the, these non-state actors. Over to you, Emily. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll, build, I'll build on what Agnes just said uh, in a second. I think the main thing to take into consideration to answer that question and that relates to, to Agnes and, and Vasilka's points is there are a variety of, of armed non-state actors um, in terms of how they organize, what they fight for, how they fight for it, what kind of service they provide or not to the population under their controls. And their respective attitudes towards human rights in general depend from all those criteria. 
Um, what we know and what I would like to highlight is twofold. The first one is, uh, although Vasilka mentioned it at the beginning, from a state's perspective, there, be, there seems to be a false assumption that armed non-state actors do not want or cannot respect human rights. Uh, and therefore, you know, it's the, it's the prerogative of states, but we know to the contrary um, that there are many documented instances where respect for international human rights law is either foundational to a group, so it has motivated its very existence, as is, it was the case um, for certain groups in Syria and Libya that were formed as a reaction to violations committed by state authorities, and if respect for human rights is not foundational, it is sometimes inscribed and is the main legal reference for those groups, um, as is the case, for instance, of the Free Syrian Army that has declared its commitment and willingness uh, to respect human rights, and is also the case of the FARC. So we have not only human rights as a key component of the values of certain groups, but we also have many instances where human rights have actually been respected, um, and the reasons um, for such respect have also been well documented, uh, including by organizations such as the ICRC, which published um, a study on roots of restraints, I think last year or, or the year before, which looks at several groups and explains in detail what has propelled them towards respect. Um, so that's the first point is false assumption. And the second, um, and again, Vasilka mentioned it, I think it's important not only to want to ascribe a legal framework to non-state armed groups, but also to engage with them on what they're willing and able to respect and why they would like to do so. Um, so in order to make sure that the obligation that are ascribed to them reflect their needs, characteristics and capacities. Uh, and in order to do so, um, the Geneva Academy, together with Geneva Call, has an ongoing project called From Words to Deeds. It's conducted by my colleague Anissa Belal, and basically the project aims at exploring non-state armed group practice um, and interpretation of key norms of both IHL and IHRL in order to understand how these can not only, you know, bound um, groups, but also actually be implemented by them. Um, and if I may build on what Agnès was saying before, attitude and reason for respect of human rights, why, how human rights is respected by a group and how it is implemented, um, I think very much depends from the circumstances prevailing in each of those situations. And that's why uh, some scholars have developed what is called a sliding scale theory, meaning ascribing uh, human rights obligations to armed groups depending on their actual capacities on the ground. So the more control they have over territory and people, the more obligation a group would have. Um, and it's an, attempt at formula, it's an attempt at bridging the gap between a very orthodox view of the law and what happens in practice. But again, it's an attempt and it needs to be sketched down and fleshed out a bit in terms of what it means but I think it's an interesting piece, as we would say in French. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, my next question goes to Anki. And I mean, Emily was also, uh, or, or Emily and other, the other panelists were also of, of talking about the need to engage with, um, with the non-state actors. And maybe you could elaborate a bit uh, what can be done to improve the respect of human rights uh, by non-state actors and non-state parties to conflict? I think that's the field where fight for humanity is active. So we're curious to hear your views. Over to you, Anki. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, Emily already started to stretch out a bit. I think that's that's very good. In the same line, I think we, what we have seen is that in spite of being organizers of violence, uh, many non-state parties to conflict or are non-state actors. They know human rights law and some of them also care about human rights law. It doesn't mean necessarily that they all respect, uh, but they are aware, as, as Emily said, uh, many uh, of these actors uh, perceive that they themselves or that the people that uh, they are claiming to protect have been victims of human rights abuses, uh, so directly or indirectly, which uh, indeed has influenced the decision to take up arms. So it's kind of a kind of core uh, belief of, of the organizations. 
Uh, but then the issue is that often they see human rights as something that they can claim <laughs> that belongs to them or to their communities uh, and not necessarily as something that they should also respect and provide. And this perspective would need to be challenged and slowly changed uh, so that non-state partners to conflict also take measures to increase their own respect of human rights. And there are different uh, things that can be done to improve the respect of, uh, of human rights, though it's of course not a quick process. But uh, you can uh, conduct dissemination sessions or trainings on human rights with members of, of these uh, non-state parties, and especially with members of de facto administrations, uh, of civilian actors, also not just the military actors, as Angus was talking about the governance function, um, so that is very important. One can work also with, with them to, to modify the rules in favor of, of a people's rights, in favor of human rights, and also to work on, on measures of practical implementation. Uh, for example, we, uh, we can work to support local human rights organizations that are operating on the ground, that are trying to push for, for better respect of human rights. Uh, we can support organizations that are trying to bridge and maintain a dialogue with these actors. Also to support research and reporting on what's actually happening on the ground. This can help the advocacy work, this can help the engagement work. Uh, we can also develop more targeted awareness raising campaigns for, for these areas to reach out also to a broader audience. But uh, respect and improving respect is not only about capacity, it's about also creating the incentives and the political willingness of, uh, of complying. Uh, so you need to be able to frame the topics to make it attractive uh, and understandable. Uh, and not just saying that it's the law and it should be respected and you are obliged or you're actually not obliged <laughs> to, to, to respect it. So that's not necessarily the best way to go about it. Um, and as Emily mentioned, um, it's important to understand, I think that the project that the Academy in Geneva Call has is very good in this respect and also the, um, the ICRC project um, on IHL in action. Um, it's really to understand the specific context, to understand uh, what makes the actors tick, what uh, they, re they relate to, uh, kind of what frames would function, what incentives can be interesting, and what can be done, what is actually possible to do in the specific situations. Um, and of course, the incentives, now, now we're not talking about um, resources, military resources, material resources, we are talking about other type of incentives. Uh, and for example, what can be an incentive to us is not necessarily in an incentive to uh, non-state parties and what's incentive to them might not be incentive to us. So that's really kind of on a case by case basis to understand how, how they function. Uh, for example, some, some actors could be interested in taking actions um, against sexual violence or domestic violence. Uh, also, if there will be a possibility to facilitate psychosocial support, health support to community members that have suffered sexual violence or domestic violence. Uh, maybe some of them are interested in protection of cultural properties in the areas where, where they are operating. Uh, others can be maybe motivated to work on improving disability rights. Uh, also, if they understand that this also includes war veterans um, and other people who are disabled, but they're kind of breaking down what it means. Um, some of them might also be keen to protect schools to assure the education of children in these areas. Uh, for example, just yesterday, the Syrian Democratic Forces um, took a measure. They issued a command order for the protection of schools in the areas that they are, are controlling so that uh, the specific measures that the, the, uh, the, uh, the forces need to, to take to avoid uh, putting schools at risk. Uh, another kind of more global thing, and this is more on the side of international community, is really to, to, uh, to be able to provide it the, the signal to non-state parties that inclusion in peace talks or peace processes uh, is possible uh, now and in the future, but that this comes with a certain also behavior <laughs> that um, if the, the actors know, and I think many, many of them know, that uh, if they commit a lot of uh, violations that are not acceptable to the international community, this is going to taint uh, their possibilities of being uh, part of processes. But that, then that also has to be kind of um, clear that inclusion is possible. If exclusion is the only way, then this kind of uh, reduces the incentive for, uh, for good behavior. So over to you, Peter. <laughs> 
I think you're still muted. Do you hear me now? Hello? Yes. Yes. Okay. We can. Sorry, I have problems. I didn't find the button to unmute myself. Thank you, Anki, uh, for this interesting uh, explanation. Um, my next question would go to Agnes, building on what, what, what Anki also said, what we have before uh, heard be from other speakers about um, the rights of victims. Uh, or that they don't, or they don't have the same possibility to get redress from for violations. So, how can we can the rights of the victims of armed groups be better supported? As I, as I mentioned, for justice, remedies, reparation. Agnes, please. Thank you very much. I think many um, recommendations have already been uh, put forward, and I endorse all of those um, uh, which uh, have been uh, presented. So I'm going to uh, make a few more comments. I think um, the first recommendation for me is not about armed groups, but it's about states. Uh, the first recommendation is that states should really stop relying on an ever-expanding counterterrorism legal regime which is being abused everywhere and by everyone, and which is certainly not putting forward uh, the victims. It is not a victim-centered regime, at least not in the way it has been implemented, uh, and it is not uh, doing what the previous speakers have highlighted, which is to uh, insensitize on groups uh, to protect uh, human rights. It's doing quite, uh, quite the opposite. Uh, the other implication of that legal regime, which is a disaster for the victims of armed groups, is that it is um, suggesting that humanitarian and human rights sectors that engage with uh, armed groups are themselves terrorists. And uh, the humanitarian exemption that a number of states have requested be the guiding principle for Security Council resolution on counterterrorism, that exemption is always very difficult to uh, first to include in the text and then to implement. And uh, humanitarian organizations are constantly having to negotiate access to um, communities who are being controlled by those armed groups. Uh, and those, uh, because those armed groups have been listed as terrorists, those people have no access to humanitarian assistance, no access to food, no access to medical care, no access to water, and so on and so forth. So if what we are wanting is for victims of armed groups to be protected, then the first thing we need to do as states is to ensure that they do have access to um, the actors that are prepared to provide them with uh, the kind of protection that they are uh, in fact entitled to under international uh, humanitarian and, and, human, and human rights law. Uh, the second, um, so that's the first main point. The second point I think is um, what has already been talk talked about, which is uh, establishing those policy frameworks is uh, human rights principles, guarantees, um, those incentives, which and doing that with armed groups uh, in a way that the um, um, fight for humanity, the Geneva Code, Geneva Academy, and so on are, are all doing, and uh, I think it's uh, very important. The, um, the third issue that we need to address, which was uh, uh, raised by Vasilka, is that of enforceability. And here, I um, personally, I do believe that we uh, and that states need to be more experimental. Uh, they can set up ad hoc institutions that could focus on the actions of um, non-state actors from the standpoint of human, human rights work, truth, peace, and reconciliation uh, processes and institutions are probably the most well-equipped to integrate 
uh, armed groups within uh, a human rights framework and to include that the victims of armed groups are actually benefit from the same support as the victims of state. This has been attempted in Colombia, notwithstanding the limit of the peace process in Colombia, I think at a, a substantive level, at a conceptual level, the integration of the FARC in that process is very important. The integration of the victims of the FARC in that process are uh, very important. And then finally, I say, I will conclude by saying we need more um, uh, conceptual work. I mean, we're talking about practicalities and so on, but I think it is important um, to fill the, the gap that is both legal and conceptual. Uh, I personally have adopted a capacity-based approach to non-state actors, armed groups. I will never suggest that they inherit or that they have the same human rights obligations as the, as the state, but they do have some obligations which are derived from their capacity to uphold those obligations and to protect people. If they can violate people's rights, trust me, in general, they can also protect people's rights. But we need to unpack those, uh, those things. We need more than a few uh, independent voices, including special rapporteur, to do so. And I would like to take the opportunity to uh, say, uh, celebrate the work done by all of the speakers on those questions and call for far more work to be done on that issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. Uh, my next question goes to Emily. Um, and maybe you can a bit elaborate what we can do to assure that binding non-state parties to conflict uh, to human rights complements rather than undermines the state's obligation to protect. Emily, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, before answering, I would just like to react to what Agnes has been saying about um, the dangerous implication of the counterterrorism framework that has been elaborated um, over the past, um, I think, decades uh, or more by, by states. Um, I think that framework, uh, unfortunately, exists and, and is there, and it's being, you know, produced um, by the United Nations, the Security Council, and then states at the regional um, and national level. Um, and it is necessary, instead of, I mean, there's no possibility of rejecting it, but I think it's very important uh, that this framework be interpreted and implemented in in a way that are compatible not only with human rights but also um, but also with IHL and I would like to rejoin Agnes in saying that humanitarian exemptions for IHL purposes is a first step uh, but that has its own challenges in terms of you know vagueness um, and so but I think it's it's a framework that is problematic but that is there and that, that we have to compose with uh, and we sort of have to hold the line in emphasizing that IHL and human rights still apply alongside that framework um, and that that framework does not replace them. Um, and then to answer your question, what can be done to assure um, that binding armed non-state actors complements state's obligation? I think the first, um, the first point, um, and that is perhaps the most important one, and I think Vasilka has hinted to it, is that even in instances where armed non-state actors have gained control of territory um, instead of a state, the territorial state remains the primary holder of the obligation to ensure respect for human rights. And I think that is, you know, it's important to underline and it's also important to unpack that obligation to ensure respect, what this means and how it can be done specifically. We have very vague, um, formulation of this obligation in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights and uh, ensuring respect means taking all measures necessary uh, in the form of legislative, judicial, administrative or other types of measures. Um, so I think it would be very interesting um, to start creating thinking about what those measures would look like and have, um, you know, not only creativity um, with regards to what Agnes mentioned in, in the form of states formulating standards and mechanism for holding non-state actors into account, but also to making sure that uh, efforts are complementary and that it can give a full pictures of 
rights holders, so states and non-state actors um, together, but also allow for the inclusion of victims' narrative um, of both sides. So complementarity, I think, is the key word I would like to highlight here, also as a matter of law and not only practice. Uh, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, my last question goes to Anki and goes a bit on a similar topic. Uh, uh, what are the challenges for activists, rights uh, organizations to advocate on human rights towards non-state parties to conflict? And how could these challenges be overcome, Anki? Sorry, I also started without. <laughs> I'm going to cut a bit short on the challenges, I think, because we already, and I, I think uh, Agnes mentioned very, very, um, some of the very uh, main one, which is, of course, access. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, of course, uh, some main access uh, issues are um, linked to security, access, resources, existing capacities. Uh, I'm going to focus more on, on, on the ones that are linked directly to the advocacy part. Uh, so I mentioned that the, the, um, the point of incentives or like of selling uh, the, the, um, the concept, selling human rights in a sense. So I think one issue, and, and that has been raised by, by all the speakers, I think it's, it's the problem of, um, that, I mean, there is a, a global perception that there is a lack of accountability in general. So lack of accountability for states and for non-state actors. Um, so that there is something broken in the international system in terms of, uh, of respect and accountability. Uh, and I think an additional issue there that's also a challenge, uh, I think, is, is the issue of the proxy conflicts, uh, where you have many different actors involved, and that also kind of dilutes the accountability and the responsibility um, in, in partic particular settings. Um, there's also a challenge linked to how we want to produce change is kind of how to move from uh, highlighting negative examples or using just bad behaviors for shaming, but kind of how we go beyond that, basically. Uh, research in neuroscience has shown that uh, showcasting violations may actually have a counterproductive effect. So it can contribute to more and not fewer violations. Um, so in that sense, we need to think about also how we project positive change, how we project what we want to see and not just what we want to, uh, don't want to see. Uh, I, I mentioned some, some uh, ways of, of working and I think of overcoming the challenges. Of course, um, it's, uh, it requires still a lot of work and I agree with Agnes that there's a lot of conceptual work also to be done still. Uh, but, but indeed to continue to work to raise awareness and knowledge of the non-state parties, uh, but also of the communities um, in, and um, organizations that are operating in, in these areas. Uh, also to, to, to work more, um, again, to identify specific incentives for positive behaviors. And this we can do by establishing a dialogue and understanding of the specific uh, organizations. Then maybe uh, getting back to, to, to kind of methodology, um, uh, in terms of the naming and shaming type of um, method, I think we, we have seen still from our experience that it can have an impact, uh, but it needs to be done within kind of certain conditions. Uh, and, and that's kind of when there are other factors that kind of facilitate change also. Uh, for example, if there is a solution that can be offered uh, there is a possibility of, of training or support for, for changing and the proxy conflicts can also have the advantage in a sense that there can be allies or other influential actors that can come in and also put pressure or provide really concrete incentives for changing certain, uh, certain behavior. Uh, and I think uh, Emily mentioned complementarity, uh, and I think that's also something that's important in the in the methodology in the in the advocacy for for, for change. Is also uh, there can be some organizations that are more focused on reporting and on, on shaming, and others that can be more focused on on dialogue, discussion, training. Uh, not necessarily always the same uh, actors that do the same things. And states can have a very important role also for sure in, in, in influencing um, the behavior. Uh, and, and I think maybe to, a final point, um, 
I, I think in, in terms of the in terms of the reporting, uh, really also to see what we can do to to recognize um, the difficulties that there might be to to implement human rights in this context, and knowing that as a uh, several uh, speakers were mentioning that, that the capacities that maybe all actors don't have the capacities to to fulfill all uh, human rights. We, we should also be kind of sensitive that uh, there are violations that happen because of choice. There are violations that happen uh, because of lack of capacities, because of lack of knowledge, uh, and really to kind of try to to build around that. And uh, if we can also uh, try to see that there is a willingness to 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 work on issues, then also to kind of to highlight that and to to incentivize that um, and not only kind of report on the things that are not happening. Um, and I think if, if that uh, what one problem otherwise, if we only focus on the negative parts, uh, we, might, um, we might end the dialogue, we might um, lose the incentive for, for work to improve the respect for human rights. We need to be also kind of looking at uh, highlighting when some things are, are being done. So, back to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Anki. Uh, this brings us to the end of our of the discussion among the panelists, and I would like to thank all the panelists for a very, very rich, interesting, and inspiring discussion. Um, and now, before we move to the Q and A, I understand there is uh, another poll. Uh, so oh, uh, I give the floor back to Nicolas. Yes, so after hearing from uh, our different speakers, we would like to have your opinion on these like uh, crucial questions. So and see if you, if you were convinced by the different interventions. So do non-state parties to conflict have human rights responsibilities under human rights law? So if you can vote and um, we will see. Okay, so five more seconds. Okay, so <clears throat> we can see that there's a large majority of yes, but there's still a few people who believe that uh, uh, no state party do not have uh, human rights responsibilities. So I think it's uh, up to the international community and all humanitarian actors to make it um, more reality, you know? So, um, Peter, maybe we move to the Q&A session. Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know, uh, Nicolas, do we, uh, I think we have questions from the chat, is that correct? Uh, yes, absolutely. So we have a first question, uh, maybe for, um, Vasilka, um, so um, uh, the question relates to the practice of uh, UNHCR, UN uh, uh, Secretary, uh, UNSC, sorry, and other bodies to make a distinction, although not always consistently, between human rights violations by states and human rights abuses by armed groups. Do you think that the term abuse has any legal significance? Or if we do understand abuse to mean that the underlying acts are politically deplorable, but not a violation of uh, IHRL, uh, does that mean they're in fact legal? So it's a bit long question, but over to you, uh, Vasilka. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, well, I uh, do believe that the language was intentionally chosen to refer to abuses in some cases, but I also have to remark that this uh, usage of terms abuses or violations is not consistent, even in the practice of the Security Council uh, decisions. So, um, yes, I think it is a political decision not to refer to violations when speaking of non-state actors in certain cases. Um, however, um, I think the effect of referencing to certain um, behavior as abuses does not change the obligation of the state to address <laughs> these violations, uh, including not just acting uh, in terms of uh, ensuring respect for fulfilling their positive obligations, but also to provide remedies. I think this is very important to uh, 
highlight that um, and that is um, evident from basically many concluding observations also of the human rights committee which i'm a member of uh, that um, it's the state is not off the hook when for example it cannot uh, control a certain territory which is under the control of uh, non-state armed parties but that it has to uh, employ all available um, diplomatic, um, economic, judicial, and other means, not only to stop the abuses and to investigate and then prosecute and punish those responsible, but also to provide effective remedies to the victims. And I think uh, this is uh, regardless of whether we refer to abuses or violations of non-state actors. Thank you. So Thank you very much. Um, there's an another question for Agnes. Um, so you were quite critical towards the international uh, counterterrorism laws. So the question is, is how has the international counterterrorism regime weakened uh, IHL and, and human rights law? And how can a balance between these three um, uh, regimes be achieved? What should the international community do to achieve this balance? Agnes. Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for, the, for the question, which is a, a, an extensive one. Um, so in terms of the, um, the weakening uh, of, uh, of IHL and uh, IHRL, uh, the imposition of the creation of that counterterrorism regime in its uh, text at times and certainly in its implementation has conflicted with some key principles of uh, humanity, necessity, proportionality, um, and so on. Um, you know, I mean, I, the, maybe I could give you a, an example of the so-called uh, targeted killings of um, of so-called uh, terrorist individuals, including in non-international armed conflict or outside um, what is known as an armed conflict, the imposition of that counterterrorism uh, framework has uh, established the um, uh, as eliminated the boundaries between conflict and peace. It has melted. Uh, the two um, the two scenarios in ways which have proven to be um, very detrimental to uh, human rights uh, protection. In most cases, where there are not all, there have been some progress recently, but in many cases where so-called terrorists are being tried, that is uh, for the multiple violation they have committed, some of which may amount to genocide. But in fact, those individual members of armed groups, of terrorist groups, are being tried on the basis of membership to a terrorist organization. And that's why I have suggested that victims are not, that this regime is not victim-based. It is, a, in my view, it is a regime that is about the state. It is not a regime that is about the people. Uh, and in almost uh, all the trial that I have looked at uh, in Iraq, for instance, uh, until very recently, and like I said, there have been progresses over the last few months, victims were not even part of the trial of so-called uh, Daesh members or alleged Daesh members. The same applied to Europe where you had this discrepancy between applying uh, international counterterrorism or domestic counterterrorism law to the members of a so called terrorist group and then applying international criminal law or criminal law to members of a state uh, actors such as members of the Syrian uh, armed forces. And, that gap means that victims are treated completely differently and that history is treating what these um, individuals or groups have done uh, differently, even though they may have actually committed uh, genocide or, or crimes against uh, humanity. I've already spoken about the, uh, the humanitarian exemption, which means that uh, victims of 
uh, terrorist groups are actually victim, victimized twice. They are victimized by the armed group, the terrorist group, and then they are victimized by the international community that makes it very difficult for humanitarian actors to access those individuals. Um, anyway, and there are far more technical details on how uh, international humanitarian law and human rights law have been um, uh, very much weakened by that particular regime. I do not disagree with uh, Emily's point that the regime has been here for 20 years, it's not going to disappear. I certainly think that tactically it is important to insist on uh, the complementarity between the regime and human rights law. Um, I am absolutely not convinced that conceptually and substantively that complementarity actually exists. And that's why I want to invite us all including uh, lawyers and advocates at international level to be a more challenging of the actual um, uh, precept and basis of that uh, new international regime. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes, for this. I think uh, we understood your, your point that victims um, should be at uh, the core of this, uh, of this debate. Um, uh, so there, there's another question uh, from the floor uh, directed to uh, Anki. So how do um, uh, Fight for Humanity experts view the split on approaches to the different kinds of um, non-state actors, uh, centralized de facto authority type um, with state structure, with state-like structures and behavior or community embedded uh, uh, armed actors? Thank you. Yeah, uh, th thanks, Nicola, for that question. Um, yeah, I, I think for sure, um, and I think that has come out also strongly in this discussion, uh, we cannot put a one-fits-all type of solution uh, to, to actors that, that are, are so different. Um, so, so for sure, I think now, now mainly I, I was talking more about um, groups that are indeed controlling territory more in the classical sense, so not like the ones only controlling at nighttime. Uh, but I think it, it's a very valid point that Agnes makes also that we, we need to be, I think, flexible. We need to develop and not base ourselves on, on kind of uh, concepts that, that were developed 70 years ago, that like now things are, are happening before our eyes. <laughs> and I think that the approach of like putting the victims in the center is very important. So, so for sure, we, we cannot, there are some, um, actors that have uh, very sophisticated um, civilian and political uh, structures that have hospitals, that have parliaments. It's not the same as the ones that have only fighters, that fighters are doing everything. Uh, so, so I think we really do uh, imagine um, going more uh, into issues like, uh, I, I don't know, like freedom of, um, of speech, of association, um, the, the, the uh, right to justice uh, with actors that are really de facto controlling uh, rather than guerrilla type of, uh, of actors. So I, I think, I mean, there's a lot of things to unpack, I think, in that, in that question. Uh, and just maybe to, to say it's also something we, as Fight for Humanity, we, we are um, looking into also uh, working more on kind of developing different tools and ways for how to work on, on human rights with um, armed actors, so with political and armed actors in, in different kind of levels of, uh, of control of, of, of structure. So it, it's something to be, uh, to be continued. But uh, um, I, I, I like the, 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 the points made, I think, by, by, by both of Emily and, uh, and Agnes on kind of the, uh, the, 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 the sliding scale <laughs> and, and kind of the, the, the level of, uh, of responsibility kind of uh, increasing with the, with the capacity. And I think that that makes sense. And it's also something we would like to develop further, but more practical um, for, for, yeah, for, for, for uh, working on the, on the ground. Thank you very much, Anki. Uh, we are receiving many questions. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe we have the time to uh, take maybe two or three more. Um, there is a, a question 
that I would like to direct to Emily. So there is a, um, a question about the degree of control and duration of control that armed groups must exercise to be bound by human rights. Emily, can you <laughs> elaborate on that? Um, I, I can. That's. Um, I mean, that's that's a very tough question, as I think um, we've tried to put forward earlier in the discussion. We have, you know, we have de facto authorities, um, armed armed groups that are de facto authorities and um, control territory. And um, what control means in those circumstances needs to be sketched out. Um, I'm not sure that. Um, duration or length time-wise uh, of control should be a criteria per se. That said, um, it's very hard to imagine an armed group that controls the territory only for several hours or several days and can put in place the necessary, um, I wouldn't say administration, but structures that allow that armed group to actually respect human rights. Um, so in terms of territory, I mean, I think territory and in terms of space, it has to be relatively substantial, but it could also be, you know, a village or maybe bigger. And in terms of duration, I think it's about pragmatism. That said, um, those criteria have not been sketched out in the law per se. Um, I've deduced them and I think that's where there is an interesting parallel to be done with issues of jurisdiction for the purpose of exercising human rights and the state's jurisdiction extraterritorially maybe. That's where, you know, it would be interesting to look at for sketching frameworks and also um, IHL and then um, occupation, which exists only in international armed conflict, but it's a legal institution where we admit that one entity controls the territory of another. Um, and there, there are precise criteria for what that kind of control means. And that's again, um, where we can look at. Um, so I guess the key feature of my answer is that's what we need to be creative and there are a lot of places to look at for inspiration. Um, can I add something? Oh, please. Uh, I, I think, I mean, the question is interesting, but in my view and um, the, whoever asks it need to understand that we, we, we have to be careful to, to transfer a concept that was meant for IHL into a situation that we have argued should be governed by IHRL. The concept of control under IHL is, uh, if you look at how it's being defined, it's very much defined in military terms, in operational military terms. I think what we have argued, uh, more or less, is that in many situations, those armed groups operate functions that are not included in the definition of control under IHL. Personally, I have used the concept of governance. You can, um, you can use any other terms which are meant to demonstrate the, the breadth and the richness, in quotation mark, of uh, the functions uh, of, those, uh, of those armed groups. Um, and then the other issue I think that is important to highlight is that of cyber control. You know, the reason why I have suggested that we needed a lot of flexibility with regard to, um, uh, to uh, control is because uh, we have situations that are increasing situations where actually groups, individuals are exercising control through cyber means and are exercising cyber controls. In my view, if we want our legal framework to be adapted and to be reflective of the reality we live in, we must also take into account the, the fact that control is developing very quickly and that one can exercise extremely harsh control, including control over people's life and death through means other than physical presence. Thank you. May I? May I react to what Agnes just said? Sure, please go okay. ahead. <laughs> no, thanks. Um, I mean, I would like to, to disagree with, with Agnes um, a little when she says that uh, control in IHL is mainly defined in military and, viol uh, and violent terms. Um, in my opinion, that's where occupation is an interesting parallel to draw from because occupation as an institution 
is typically where a state comes to have a sufficient level of control to exercise government-like function and what Agnès called governance in another state territory. And that level of control implies having moved on from conduct of hostilities and very intense violence phase to something that is more akin to daily life and, um, and the ensuring of public order and safety, as we say in IHL. So I think occupation is definitely um, an interesting place to look like, where um, and also bridges uh, IHL and human rights uh, because it is more akin to peacetime rather than to conduct of hostilities per se, all the while recognizing it's still um, a situation of armed conflict. Well, thank you very much for these uh, important precisions. Um, I think now it's time to um, conclude. Um, uh, thank you very much for all the questions. Sorry if we could not answer all of them, but we will have uh, more events in the future. So you, I encourage us to, I encourage you to uh, follow us on, on on social media for the um, for the for the next events. And I would like to hand over to uh, Ambassador Peter Matt for the concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, if you allow me, I, I realized I forgot a question I wanted to address to Professor Sanchin. And very briefly, I think I would be interested to hear your views. It's about the obligations of the state to ensure that the people's uh, human rights are protected in the territories where they have lost control. We heard about that. What, what I would be interested to hear very briefly, your view, whether engagement on human rights with non-state parties to conflict would amount to a violation of uh, state sovereignty. If you can very briefly elaborate on that before I conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. In the interest of time, I will really be very brief. I think it depends on a particular case. So I would uh, make this assessment on a case by case basis. It depends on the uh, form and intent and um, let's say uh, the modalities of uh, this intervention. I think the discussing human rights situation in other countries would no circumstances amount of violation of sovereignty, but of course, if a state engages in some conduct um, on another state's territory in support or in uh, uh, to, let's say, interfere with uh, some measures taken by non-state parties on that territory that could certainly amount to violations of state sovereignty. So it depends on a case by case, it depends on the form and intensity of intervention. Thank okay, you. thank you, Professor. Um, yeah, I, I would start by thanking all the panelists for a really very uh, rich, inspiring uh, discussion. I learned really a lot about uh, non-state parties to conflict and all, all, and I realize it's a very complex issue. It's difficult to summarize a discussion like that and in interest of time, I will be rather brief, just maybe highlight some issues. Uh, uh, I think Agnes mentioned that we are coming from a very orthodox um, understanding of human rights and that we have we have to yeah to do some conceptual work to adapt it to the to the reality that we are facing now with non-state actors uh, being yeah uh, being uh, increasing. I also thought interesting the issue of the, what Agnes mentioned, the governance function uh, of, of non-state actors, because I mean, in usually we, we um, think of them in the context of violence, but not necessarily in the context of the governance function and this the false, uh, uh, false uh, assumption in this context. Interesting is certainly also the, the issue of the anti-terrorist regime uh, that of the need for a humanitarian exception there. Um, also think interesting that we should create a forum for to exchange with human rights with uh, non-state uh, parties to conflict. This is certainly a, dif a difficult issue, but I think it's something that is worth, worth uh, further uh, to think about. Um, we also heard about the issue of enforceability. Uh...
Peter, I think you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was mute all the time. Okay, sorry. <laughs> well, um, yeah, sorry for that. Uh, I, we will be very brief. I just wanted to thank all the, the panelists for a very rich and inspiring uh, discussion. I really learned a lot. Um, in the interest of time, I will be very brief. Uh, it's difficult to summarize such a rich discussion. Um, maybe it's just a few points, or, or maybe on, on the legal framework, we heard that uh, that uh, there is the perceptual expectation that uh, human rights apply to non-state actors, but uh, there needs more work to be done. We need to do more conceptual work. We need also to move from maybe what Agnes, uh, I think, said was a orthodox understanding of human rights to a more appropriate understanding of human rights ruling rights that is more adapt to the reality on the ground. Um, something that also I think is worth mentioning is that we need to think about a forum for exchange with, uh, with human rights, uh, uh, with non-state actors. Uh, I think this is something very important. Then I would also like to mention the issue of enforceability, where more, where more work needs to be done. And this context, of course, uh, the victims' rights are very important. Um, and I would also like to mention the anti-terrorist regime that uh, Agnes mentioned, Agnes and other panelists mentioned, uh, the, the need for this humanitarian exception, and to also there to think about the more victim-centered approach. Um, I also found very interesting uh, the governance function. Uh, what was mentioned by Agnes, uh, usually we have the perception that armed group, non-state armed actors are only, um, we think with them in the context of violence, but not necessarily in governance function. Uh, maybe to what, how do we proceed or what should we do in the future? I think um, uh, also what uh, Anki mentioned that we need to, to to also to think about a positive approach to incentivize for, for them, for the non-state actors to respect human rights, to engage with them. Uh, and not only to think in, in negative or uh, in negative um, terms about them. Um, I think I will leave it with that. I think it was a very uh, interesting um, exchange. It's a start. It's only the start for further conversations about this very important topic. I think there is a lot to be done about that. Um, and with this, again, many thanks for to the panelists uh, to the Fight for Humanity for organizing this event and for all participants and for the very interesting questions we got from the, from the audience. And uh, we are looking forward to continue uh, these discussions on this very important topic. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank a nice you very evening. much. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.